Why, what was the decision to stick with Dustin and go away and release him? Well, right now, he's on the roster, so he's our punter. So, I mean, that was an easy, easy decision because Cam is part of the, the you know, 52, 53 man roster. So, we wanted to stay with him but just because the continuity, the, what we have in that room with the, with the players, including Josh and Koo, and keeping that rhythm going. And then, you know, Dustin continues to improve with reps. So, we're happy to have him in the building. I know we have to talk about Youngway quite a lot, especially here this year because of what he's been able to do for a lot of this year, but um, kind of what can you say about Youngway, in a sense, kind of like always being the same guy? Like, he seems like really consistent mindset-wise to me. Can you kind of speak to what you see from him in that regard? I think the word that you brought up was consistent. You know, he continues, he's learned through his career, you know, early in his career, starting back in 17 with the Chargers, the opportunity we got to work together. Um, he learned about himself, learned about his process and how he, uh, goes about the game and the mental aspect and how it correlates for him physically and it's shown through his play the last couple of years. I mean, ever since he stepped foot in the, you know, flowery branch, he's been consistent and it shows with the, you know, the work that he's putting in and how he's producing. And also too, he believes in his teammates. So, you know, it goes without being said, you have Josh out there doing a great job, trusting his teammates, Dustin, you know, holding the ball for him. And then the other guys, nine guys out there that are, you know, Holding, or the other eight guys out there holding the football for or protecting for him inside and out with the protection and Koo having that comfortable, being comfortable and trusting his teammates with that. And then knowing too, no matter what the outcome is, he still has to do his job. So if a guy gives up leaky protect it, protect or leaky pressure, he's still thinking like, I still got to put the ball through the uprights or I got to kick the ball downfield on kickoff a certain way. So he really puts it on himself and he's a leader, you know, leads by example and he will voice, you know, to the players in the huddle, like his responsibility and then having ownership in his responsibility, what he has to do on the field. What's kind of the difference between the young way that you met a few years ago and the young way now? You know, the young way that I met a few years ago, he didn't know what he didn't know. So as a rookie coming in, you have certain expectations or a certain uh, viewpoint of how you think the NFL is and how he's supposed to do his job. And then going through those, you know, uh, peaks and valleys in the beginning of his NFL career really taught him a lot on how he should approach the game and how he needs to, you know, really dial in on his technique, um, you know, being firm with what he wants to do and how he wants to approach the game. And that really helped him because I think, too, like you never get put in positions that you can't handle. But at the same time, you have to learn from those experiences. And that's how you grow as an individual. And it really humbled him. And he's a humble individual as it is right now. And when you go through experiences like that where it's uncomfortable, that allows for great growth. And it, it speaks volumes for him as a person because he allowed himself to grow and learn from those experiences. Is there, is there added value in having a, a veteran like Dustin in, the, in that room? Yes, it is, Chris. Just because of his experience, he's seen everything. He knows how to handle certain situations in game. He brings a calmness to the sideline when it comes to, you know, whether it's you know, punting or holding for field goals. And we trust him, you know, we trust him. He, he knows how the game's gonna be played. He's been in a lot of different situations and, you know, it comes down to, you know, being able to execute. So he continues to get better with reps. He's only had a couple games under his belt. And then again, too, he's, he didn't start the 18 or the 21 season with us. So it was a great opportunity for him to continue to get better each and every week when it comes to that. But it's a blessing to have him in the room for our whole special teams unit. Just talking about that. <laughs> I'm asking a question kind of hypothetically. What's the ceiling for how high you would you would argue to draft a punter? I mean, what, what's the what's the maximum value of that position that you would that you would argue for? You know. That's not even a question for myself, you know, because I coach the guys that I have, we have in the room or the guys that we get that we get on the on the on the roster. Um, but if there's a guy out there that's worth drafting, that's a conversation that we have with you know Coach Smith and Terry about that. But there's every every year there's about one to two punters that get drafted, and it's just depending on the need for that team and the talent that's out there for that that draft pick. But that's more of a Arthur and Terry question when it comes to that. I mean, it brings great value because not only do they have to punt for us, does he have the ability to kick off 
And then does he have you know great enough hands where he can hold the ball for us? And when it comes to PAT field goals, when we're putting points on the board, but being able to flip the field, create our control field position for our defense, and being able to eliminate returners in the return game, I think there's a lot of value in that because, again, that's the first play on defense when it comes to punting the football. Yeah, I mean, again, you think about as a punter, as a punter, you, or yeah, right now as a punter in the NFL, or just a punter, you know, back then, no matter what, before you perform your technique to punt the ball, you have to catch the ball. So you got to have some type of hand-eye coordination. You got to catch the ball. So, you know, when you talk about a punter, whether they're holding or punting the ball, they got to catch the football. And then also, too, they, the time-wise, time management-wise, you think about in practice, that backup quarterback is usually working with the offense with stuff. Now you have a punter. He's already over there with the kicker. So now you're just gaining that rhythm, gaining that comfortability, getting better with reps. So it just makes sense when it comes to that aspect. Now I've been on teams, too, where we had our backup quarterback hold. And, you know, when it comes logistically, it, it's kind of hard, too, when it comes to in practice, whether you're getting those reps before or after practice when it comes to that, because now you're pulling him away from the offense. That makes sense. Really? Makes a ton of sense. Have you explored what might be too far to punt the ball? I mean, I, I know that there's, you know, how far can you realistically cover? Obviously, you can kick it eight yards. That's great. You know, I keep, we can't get down there in whatever amount of time. Is, is there, have you looked into what's the, the point of diminishing returns there? Yes. You know, when you're trying to flip the field, you know, that's a great question. We kind of talked about this during training camp. You want to have that healthy um, combination of direction plus hang time and then still have some direction ability with that when it comes to that. So now, if you're kicking the punt the ball 60 yards and there's a 4-1 hang time, well, you're not really giving your, your punt team the opportunity to get downfield and cover because you got to remember, those guys that are correlated to the line of scrimmage and punt protection, they're on offense until the ball's punted. So they got to protect first, then cover. And that transition is really hard. So by the time they protect and then cover, and it's a 4-1 hang time, 60 yards downfield, let's say we only cover 20 yards. You know I mean? 20 or 30 yards by the time that ball is caught. So that's not the best correlation or, you know, that we want when it comes to punt and coverage. Now, if you get some hang t now, if you get the ball punted to the sideline and let's say it's 45 or 60 yards and it's a four one hang time, but the ball goes out of bounds, the hang times are relevant because we got, it's not a returnable ball, but if you punt a ball that's four, eight hang time and it's 50 yards and you're able to force a fair catch, like we did a couple of weeks ago, you know, versus Carolina, that's what you want. And it helps with the gunners too. If they're getting singled or double press, getting them an opportunity and giving them time to get down there and be players for us. Because the gunners, based on the formations that we have in punt, they don't have to protect. They can release and go. So we try to give those guys an opportunity to go down there with directional releasing, getting the ball to the proper direction, and allowing those guys to make plays and be effective on the returner. This might be a question, but how many players do you want to ideally have on your team that can handle being a gunner? Like, is there, like, do you feel like you need five, you know, throughout the, to have at any point? Six? I mean, it, it varies. It just depends on what their role is on offense and defense. You know, it could vary from three. You know, I've been on teams, and even currently right now, it could be as many as eight to nine, you know. So it just depends on what their roles are on offense and defense when it comes to in correlation to special teams and how – you know, what's their impact as a gunner when it comes to that. But the more the more that you have, the better it is to be able to rotate guys out, especially if you have some guys that are offensive players that are playing on offense, and then now they're on second, third down, now they got to go to special teams and having those extra guys that could go out there and play gunner. You know, last year we had multiple guys when I was in Detroit playing gunner. This year, you can see when you're watching, we have multiple guys out there that could play the gunner position, whether you're watching practice or in game. And it's an opportunity for those guys to go out there and make an impact for our team. I mean, it's up there. It varies week by week. It just depends on who's up on the on the on the game day roster. But even if you count practice squad, yeah, we're we're about that high when it comes to those those positions. And it's a it's a fluid room because it's a great opportunity for those guys to go down there and make plays and be effective in the game. It's the first play on defense for us. Judging, judging by um, obviously the last game going into this game, what are some things that you like on the special teams that you want to continue to? 
I mean, a big thing, uh, continual growth, being able to grow as a unit, that continuity, having guys, whether they're playing on four phases, two phases, three phases, guys are, you know, starting to get, you know, what we want on special teams, how we want to cover, uh, we want to get the return game better, give opportunities for us. Decision making in the return game with Avery making great decisions back there as a returner, whether it's the field to punt, don't field to punt, fair catch, you know, return the ball, and then continue to get better with our one on one matchups and our basic fundamentals. You know, Coach talks about it, Coach Smith talks about being brilliant with the basics, and that's that's special teams right there blocking, tackling, getting off blocks, running, straining in coverage, all those little things that we're every week we're trying to get better at, and our guys, there's you can see it. You can see our guys growing in that aspect. And again, we want to continue to peak at the right time in the season. So we want to continue to get better. We don't want to peak too early, but it's a great opportunity for us this week. You know, going against Dallas and their special teams to go out there and and put together a complete game on special teams. I know it's kind of early, but obviously you want things to go perfectly in that game. It may not always be that way. How do you feel that your guys will respond to adversity within the game as far as the special teams? I think our guys are doing a better job because when you talk about adversity, it's about being in the present. Because you could be down about something or be mad about a previous play. You know, like, like for example, Richie Grant wasn't trying to get a penalty on the sideline. He wasn't trying to, but in the name of the game, how the game's going, six minutes and some left in the game on their sideline, that's going to happen. But the next punt, what people fail to realize, he did a great job in protection versus a linebacker, flattened him, pancaked him, and then he was on the left side of our coverage unit, and he ended up making an attack on Deontay Harris, which is a dynamic returner on our sideline. So it goes back like, yes, he made a penalty, he made a mistake, but he came back the next time and made a play and saved us and put us in a position where our defense could go out there and play ball. So it's just about being in the present. That's how we handle adversity. We got to learn from it, obviously, but we can't allow it to affect us in the present. We got to continue to get better and grow from those opportunities. Yes, sir. How has that changed? I think it changed more so schematically. Is you're not seeing as many different coverage looks when it comes to kickoff coverage, and then also too is more space being involved in the in the play. I mean, the play is, is really defined as speed and, and space. That's what it comes down to because there's no wedge blocking. There's no uh, legal double teams with the back three guys double teaming with the front eight guys. So that's where you see a lot of speed and space plays. And then you see a lot of, you know, one-on-one -on -one matchups. There's not a lot of wedge blocking. You can't do wedge block. So it's all front level double team blocks. And it's becoming more of a speed and space play. And it's a great opportunity for CP this week, you know, to go out there and help and along with the other 10 guys out there that do their job, and we treat that like a, a big running play. Go out there and try to get an explosive running play for our offense. Anything else? Cool. Thanks, Coach. Thank All right. Thanks, guys. You guys take care. Appreciate you guys.